Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Susanna Marie. And I'm pronouncing it that way because it's German, and uh, so it's not just Suzanne, uh, as Americans <laughs> would say it. Um, and Susanna was living in the Asheville area, right? And um, I almost snagged you for some kind of an interview down there, but you said, no, I've moved to the West Coast. Um, so now you're out there in Nevada City, as I understand it. And... Uh, all that is relatively superficial information, but you know, it's kind of nice to know where people are. Do yeah, you? I actually returned back to Nevada City. I was here first, mm -hmm. and then I went to Asheville for a year and a quarter, mm. and then we moved back, my whole family. So. And that's up in the Sierras, isn't it, near Tahoe or something? Yeah, it's um, in the foothills. Great. Yeah, so. Beautiful out there. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, Susanna Marie, as is her full name, um, I, I sent me some stuff to read, which was very nice. I felt like we were reading from the that we'd sort of read from the same playbook, because a lot of the concepts and principles you brought out are things that interest me a lot, and that uh, I talk about a lot, and think about a lot, and experience, mm -hmm. and and so on. Uh, another thing we have in common is that we both recently spent some time with Ama, the, hug, the so-called hugging saint, and maybe yeah. we'll be able to talk a little bit about our experience of that. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. But you mentioned in the stuff you sent that um, you experienced unity as a child, and that mm -hmm. o over time it started to fade. So um, it's usually good to kind of start with a chronological discussion sure. of a person's life. So let's start with that. Okay. Um, so I didn't know that I was experiencing unity as a child until later in life when the concept of unity came to my awareness. So what um, my experience was as a child is that um, the way that I knew that unity was leaving was by um, the um, relationship that I had with others started to become um, more fragmented. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I, I looked for um, connection with others, with the adults around me. Uh, that was, it was like very important for me to feel connected to the adults around me and I felt how the adults around me weren't connected to themselves. So I was aware at a very young age that um, that my parents and, and the adults around me suffered from some kind of disillusionment. Hmm. Yeah. So. And you, um, then you found yourself slipping involuntarily into that same illusion. Yeah. I, I told my mom at the age of nine that, um, or maybe it was seven, that my childhood was ebbing away. Mm. And, and she didn't know what to make of it. And the way that I describe it is that I felt like a, a cloak was descending over me. Mm. And it was actually visceral, that this cloak, and, and now we can use the words Maya, you know, right. or something. So I had this beautiful relationship with my brother who was one year younger than I. And with him, I, had, I maintained the connection of, of um, unfragmented connection with my brother and with other children and, and, with, and with nature. And I would look for that kind of connection with the adults around me, and sometimes I would find it in, in glimpses here and there. It's like I... I it was almost like a desperation that I craved that kind of connection. So over time, that um, disillusionment took more and more place, took hold more and more, but it never completely ebbed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I have a lot of um, story that I can tell during, you know, from the course of that time to now of what occurred in terms of reconnecting to that to that place. But when I did reconnect to it, um, like uh, 10 years ago, it, I, I call it a remembering rather than an awakening. Mm -hmm. or um, And all those words can be used. But for me, personally, the way that I relate to it the most is a remembering. It's like, ah, here I am again. 
It's, uh, it's often referred to that way traditionally, too, at the end of the Gita when Arjuna finally, you know, wakes up after this dialogue with Krishna. He says, my memory has been restored. I remember my true nature, you oh, know. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at the age of nine, I went to boarding school. So I, I lived for 14 years in Europe. Mm-hmm. My mother's German. I was raised in Europe. And at the age of nine, I went to a Swiss boarding school. And I feel like um, intuitively I, I wanted to have that experience to be in that particular place for several reasons. And one of the reasons is because the director of the school was an incredibly spiritual man, mm. a beautiful, he's still alive, a beautiful human being. He actually was adopted from Tunisia mm-hmm. and um, he was raised by Swiss parents and he started the Swiss International Boarding School. What, what city was that in? It was outside of Vevey, so that's close to Blon, um, Genève, Geneva. Mm-hmm. What year was that? <laughs> I'm terrible with time. So, um, I'm just curious because I might have been there then. 74? Yeah, I was there. <laughs> Except you were there? I was up near Lucerne, though. And, uh, but I also got down to Geneva. I was up in Avoyaz, which is up in the mountains outside uh, in, in France, uh, near, not too far from Geneva. It's, oh. a, it's a tangent, but hey, you were down the road. Beautiful, yeah, at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was the with the TM group. Right, right. Yeah. I heard about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> later, uh, one uh, at re- nine. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I so had a real funny story once when I was coming from Avoria, I was down to the Geneva airport. And my French was so poor that I ordered a glass of milk and a little sidewalk cafe as I was changing buses, and they brought me a tall, full glass of cream de mint syrup. And, and then everybody in the place stared at me like, what is this guy going to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> That's how good my French was. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thrown into um, the having to speak French, mm-hmm. so it was a total immersion. And um, that's like the best way, especially when you're young. Yeah. So this um, director of the school, he he was like my spiritual father. We had a very strong, beautiful connection, mm. and it sustained me. Um, I had a loving relationship with my parents, um, who lived in Madrid at the time, but and there was a lot of um, kindness and and um, like physical demonstrations of love in our family. But there was a disconnection that my parents had from themselves, as is typical in the collective. And you were aware of that? Yeah, very aware. How aware? I mean, were you really, could you have explained it to someone at that age, you know, if, if it were someone who could understand what you're talking about? Or, um, or was it just this sort of deep, subliminal sort of sense that things weren't right? I would have appreciated someone to have asked me, probably, yeah, uh-huh. yeah because it was this personal awareness that I didn't feel like I could share with anyone Mm. and um, I went through a period that when I was in Spain with my parents where I thought my parents were robots Mm. so during certain times they would be the robot and at other times they were my parents and when they were the robot was typically when they were with other adults Uh. you know doing the adult because they seem so artificial or unnatural or out of touch with themselves yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I wasn't scared, but it was. It, I was curious. It mm-hmm. was like, why are they different at different times? Yeah. So I would say that I, it wasn't sublimal. I would say that it was a real, uh, a conscious awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd like to throw thing in something in here because, in a way, you're implying that children are born as wholeness and uh, enlightened in a sense and then the the world sort of wears them down and they lose that and maybe if they're lucky later on they regain it Um, from a sort of a reincarnation perspective it's said that you know if you're born at all it's because you're not enlightened or you're not fully established in wholeness and there's some work yet to to undertake unless you're some kind of avatar or something and you're sort of born in a self-realized state Um, but Granted, though, I mean, I can remember such things myself, perhaps not as clearly as you. We all, there is a sort of a, a freshness and innocence about a child that we, that may seem very enlightened. But, mm-hmm. but still, you know, kids are, they scream and they have tantrums and they, you know, they, they don't necessarily seem established in equanimity, uh, yeah. which is characteristic of true experience of wholeness. So, yeah. so maybe we romanticize childhood a little bit, but there's also some truth to the notion that we do, we do lose something 
uh, of wh which, th th and there are certain qua childlike qualities to enlightenment, such as innocence and and spontaneity and so on, which uh, you know a saint has regained. Yeah. Well, I I hear what you're saying, and I don't I can't speak for every single person who remembers their childhood how it was. I'm I'm guessing that for some people that the experience of separation took hold perhaps younger than it did for me, mm. and it wasn't remembered. It's not remembered. Um, the the concept that you speak about enlightenment, if if you're reborn, it, you wouldn't be reborn. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't yeah, know it's, that a, concept it's a philosophy, from, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I do know that having forgotten to a degree uh, that experience that, um, of being one with everything uh, when it was remembered it, it was remembered in a, in a more deeply uh, embodied kind of way yeah. so perhaps what I came in with was, uh, was wasn't able what I'm guessing is that it wasn't able to sustain the density of the maya Mm -hmm. That um, exists now, yeah. And um, you know, so if you're looking as a child, if you're looking at the adults around you for confirmation of uh, this connection, and you're not getting it, you know, so perhaps at another time it, it was confirmed all over the place. So you know, that can um, I don't know. That's just being born here now, you know, at this time. That phrase you just used, being able to sustain the density of the Maya, I think is really critical. Uh, and obviously, uh, there are degrees to which the Maya is thrown at us, you know, depending on the circumstances you're born into. For some people, it's horrific. And, yeah. and there are also degrees of capability of sustaining, you know, wholeness or self-awareness in, in the midst of whatever the circumstances may be. And so there are those two variables. Um, and some people are really, you know, have the intense Maya and very little sustenance ability. And for them, it's really hell. And, and others have, you know, tremendous, you know, st a lot of wholeness to begin with. And, you know, maybe not too many challenges. And for them, it's an easy ride. And for some, it's kind of more uh, a fair amount of both. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't say I had a totally easy ride, right. but um, I mean, go going to boarding school at nine is not necessarily an easy ride. Um, but the the gift was this this person. So it's like mm -hmm. if if we want to talk about the intelligence of uh, life, yeah, it's like it placed me, and I actually had a choice. Like I chose to go to that school. Mm -hmm. So um, over. During my childhood, I feel like there were these <clears throat> little islands of relief where I would be seen. And um, another time occurred when I was 15. There was um, a faith healer in Germany by the name of Jakob who, he was like the real thing. He was a beautiful, beautiful human being, and he was already in his 70s when I met him. And I just felt so seen and uh, by, by him. It was just like my... I think that's a lot of what happens when you recognize a teacher outside of you and you know that it's um, um, a teacher that is going to provide you with the things that you need is when they're able to reflect back your true nature, mm -hmm. you know, what you are. And so, so this, this being, he was, um, <clears throat> he was a channel of St. Francis hmm. and he healed people. So he was in the Christian tradition, um, but it was beautiful, gorgeous, shiny, and all I did was 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 laugh when I was with him. I felt so light. Nice. Yeah, really nice. And so that experiences like that helped a lot during the teenage years of when persona really wanted to take hold more fully. Mm -hmm. And speaking of persona, I um, I was never very successful <laughs> at establishing. A um, anything that I could really believe in. So including uh, when high school came, I got out as soon as I can. I did a early exit program, and by then we were living in the States. And then uh, I wasn't able to complete college because I couldn't put myself into anything that was abstract and that didn't make sense to my being, at, you know, which was difficult for my parents to see. 
you couldn't take it seriously enough, in other words. Mm-mm. Yeah. Yeah, there was something that kept wanting to go for what's true, what's mm-hmm. true. So I studied yoga and um, meditation when I was, I think I was 24 or a little younger. What kind of meditation yeah. did you learn? I didn't learn any. So you just so, studied on your own? Well, I, I took... Um, classes for a whole year and became a yoga teacher and mm-hmm. did pranayama and that kind of um, leading in. Mm-hmm. But the first time, when I say I studied meditation, that's probably not true. It's more like I meditated. Right. So the first time I sat, it was I was home. Just came naturally to you. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's uh. My my kind of understanding of things. Um, for what it's worth, and I didn't, I didn't dream this up, but uh, you know, learned it from books and teachers and whatnot, and it seems to resonate. Is just that uh, people are born at different levels of evolution, different levels of spiritual development, and you know, people with a fairly high level of spiritual development are going to, you know, perhaps really not get that in. Um, Entrapped in the Maya, and will kind of break out of it again, relatively easily compared to others. I have this friend who says that you know from childhood he knew he had you know self-realization. He said, but he, when he was like in his early twenties, he experienced a ten-minute or fifteen-minute period of ignorance, and that was it for his whole life. Oh my gosh! But but he said that ten or fifteen minutes he wanted to die. He said, "How could people live like this?" <laughs> and he was just greatly relieved when it faded away again. Um, so, it's that's not really my case. I mean, for me, I feel like I, I had my dose of ignorance. <laughs> yeah, but on the general scale of things, compared to me, for instance, I I feel like, you know, you you managed to keep it together pretty well um, throughout your, you know. Well, um, it wasn't without its own form of suffering. Right. Because I wasn't clear inside what it was I needed to do to to go back home. Mm. <laughs> but at least, at least you realized there was a home. I did. Does that, that mean that, that it, that's there's big. suffering? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most people don't even realize uh, that there is such a thing and, mm. you know, much less aspire for it. And so, you know, you had this clear sense that there was something I have somehow gotten estranged from and I need to return to. And that's that's yeah. significant. Yeah, it is. And, and it's... It's this. You have to be have a. I had to trust in the in the knowing inside of which way to go. It's like I started mm-hmm. to develop pretty young a an inner compass of which way to go, mm. and I had to. It wasn't always easy to follow that because it was in general it was against the wishes of my parents and and things like that. So the strong authority figures around me who were paying for my my um, existence when yeah. I was you know going to college or something um, were were totally baffled and I was I was confused too I was confused why it was and I thought there must be there was a part of me that actually thought well maybe it's just there's I need therapy I need something, something. Wrong with me. yeah there's something wrong with me that I can't seem to want to become something mm. you know I mean in this in this world of becoming, it's that's that's um, you can see how quickly a label of something wrong could come up, you know. So, so did you sometimes ignore your inner compass and listen to the, what other people were telling you, or yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you probably for got brief periods, and then you probably just, got whacked for doing that, right? Yeah, yeah, it would just like die. Everything <laughs> would die. Everything yeah. would dry up. You know, mm. no joy, no no juice. Mm-hmm. Um, the inertia would set in. <laughs> yeah, and so after yeah. after that happened enough times, I imagine you said you, you just got more adamant about following the inner compass. Yeah, yeah, I threw it all in. <laughs> yeah, and I became a yoga student and then a yoga teacher. Where I have to say that was like incredibly wonderful time mm-hmm. for me to just throw in the towel and say this is what I'm doing, and at the same time I was trying to look for the truth. Um, you know, within these these ancient texts, you know the the sutras, the yoga sutras, and all these things, I was trying to find them, these nuggets of truth, and I would find them, but I would have to, you know, sift through all this um, wordy, heady, 
and um, old-fashioned way of, of describing it. And I was um, going towards the Hindu tradition, mm-hmm. in, in essence. I wasn't aware of the Buddhist um, tradition at the time or non-duality. I, I had no clue about Advaita or anything like that. Well, you weren't far from it if you were studying Patanjali, you know. I mean, that's just that's one of the branches of yoga, and Vedanta is another one. But I mean, of, of Hindu philosophy, so, and and there are you know hints of that in Patanjali too, aren't there? I mean, Advaita non-dual stuff. Yeah, and I didn't have a teacher to point that out to me. Mm-hmm. It was just something that hit me that would resonate, and I didn't discern what it was exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I went to live for a little while in um, in an ashram in Virginia at mm-hmm. Yogaville, uh, Sachidananda's ashram. Oh, right, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, I came across a little book by Shivananda called um, Nada Yoga. And so I discovered in that way that the, yo- that the meditation that I had been doing in- naturally was, uh, was being described in this little teeny book. So... Little by little, the outside references started to point to things that were had been true for me or had been developing organically within me. And if, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's another. I mean, just to get esoteric again, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there's there's many references in scriptures like the ones you're referring to, and in traditions like that of doing spiritual practices over many lifetimes and um, you know there's a verse in the Gita about you know if you're fortunate you're born in a family of yogis uh, and you pick up where you left off well you weren't quite born in a fam- <laughs> family of yogis but, but I must you, have done something very bad <laughs> but, but you know but you did kind of catch on to this at an early age and, and in a sense you just picked up where you had left off and perhaps perhaps it's, it, yeah it's, it's hard to know I mean I on one hand that really resonates and and um, on the other hand, I think that it's so mysterious, it's hard to know, right? Yep. I mean, in, in essence, it's just too mysterious to really know. But we can kind of feel into, you know, what may, might be true. Mm-hmm. And it's really nice for me to be able to now to be, do this work that I love to do that is what was home for me from the beginning. You know, this to have it be something that is actually interesting to others and that there are others who um, who know it to be valuable and pointing to to what's really true so because I spent so many years as, as I described as a child leading to discovering yoga being on my own mm-hmm. you know one thing yeah. you said about your childhood years a couple of interesting things you said one was understanding others before language like uh-huh. you sort of were kind of like picking up on a level of their thought process before it even formed or some such thing right because i learned uh four different languages within a four year time mm-hmm. i don't remember one of them so well but it was so fast and um just I was thrown into Italy, Italian, I was thrown into Spain, I was thrown into the French speaking part of Switzerland. I already spoke German, English. Mm-hmm. So um what I think what happened is that I was just paying attention and it was already kind of my nature to to listen and to pay attention to what people were really saying since I was very little. You know, what are people really saying? Mm. What are they really communicating, even if the words that are coming out are blah 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 what is really happening and so uh, yeah I think it's like an intuitive faculty it's yeah. another sense almost you know I think we all have it but it can be strengthened like a muscle yeah yeah and you also mentioned communing with beings and guides from other realms that was happening while you were a child so oh. well more when I was a teenager, it huh. started to really come in that I would. Um, it started off with having a real interest, probably around the age. Well, actually, I started having an interest in the um, in the mystical when I was in boarding school. We would call in ghosts and different things. You know how kids will do. Right. So I actually would see stuff. 
I don't know about the power of imagination in this case, but and it just grew from there. So in my teenage years, I would, in when I was sleeping, I would wake up, and often there would be beings in the room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it it, I, it felt benign. Human and, human looking type beings. Yeah, ghostly, like ghostly. A, huh. kind of yeah, ephemeral. So some subtle perception. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, and then when I was. Uh, exploring um, when I was doing when I was meditating a lot and doing yoga I had some visitations from beings I I think that for me they were they became guides on a certain level Mm -hmm. of um, tuning into higher higher more subtle realms yeah and um, did they give some actual direction to your life um, in a concrete sense, or was it just sort of this abstract sort of in, infusion no. of wisdom, which hard to pinpoint exactly how it played out in the relative? No, I felt guided. Mm-hmm. I felt guided. And like your inner compass was being magne- yeah. magnetized by them a little bit. Yeah, I felt I felt like that was I was um, aligning myself with the with the mystical realms, and and I thought that that was the way to to liberation. Mm-hmm. You know, I. It must have been like you were talking about earlier, just something that ca- I came in with. Yeah. This 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 openness towards um, other realms, other beings, being guided in my dreams, very active dream life. Hmm. And whenever I felt things slowing down on the inner, in terms of my inner development, I would ask for a dream, and boom, I hmm. would get this this um, this dream that would point, you know, and. Uh, dreams of opening up the third, the the third eye, and I mean on and on. And when I met Ama, uh, I would have dreams of Ama mm-hmm. quite a bit. And then um, dreams of uh, when I went. Uh, I lived in Taos for for six years, Taos, New Mexico, and I went to the Neem Karoli Baba Ashram there. Hmm. I don't know if you know who he is. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 In fact, when I was seeing Ama in Santa Fe one time, a, a bunch of his followers came down and did some chanting of something. Probably the Chalisa. Yeah, um, that was it. That was it. Yeah. So then, when I got connected with the temple there, I had dreams of Nimkoli and of Hanuman. So it's like wherever I would open myself up, then it would just come rushing in. Mm-hmm. So the. I can say that I was wired that way, you know, just some people are more mm-hmm. wired that way, but it, as you know, it doesn't really have to do with awakening. I mean, it it, it doesn't, awakening. but I wouldn't brush it off to the extent that some people do, you know, because I think, I mean, peop, especially people who have never had such experiences, you know, they tend to brush it off, that, that, that's just a distraction. But I think, you know, awakening is a, a much more sort of multifarious phenomenon than just locking into the absolute there's there's all this sort of subtle unfoldment that can be associated with it either before or after the big event if there is a big event you know what i mean it's 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 um yeah i think that you're right it, you can't really separate out what what leads to anything you yeah know? you can't say that um that has nothing to do with it but in a sense when when realization happens then it is the same experience, the same realization in every phenomenon, in all phenomenon, whether it's in this more dense form and all in the subtle realms. So, so realizing that, for me at least, I had to step out of the stream of being attached mm-hmm. to that kind of um, phenomenon. I would say it was a, a form of addiction, I mean, well, even you say you studied Patanjali. I mean, even in the Yoga Sutras, it says, "Don't be, um, how is it? Don't be, you know, caught up in if the celestial beings invite you and you know try to get you all engaged. That can be a, I forget the wording. That can be a deterrent or a, a hang-up, uh, you know, an impediment, and you have to move beyond that." Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's very seductive, right? Mm-hmm. So it's so charming. It's charming. Like my life is really hard. Let me just have a. A little hit of <laughs> of the of the beyond, you know. Yeah. So so my life did get really hard, and the uh, when uh, my brother died mm. in two thousand two, 
The one and you I, were so close to. Yeah, yeah. So we were one year apart, and and we had maintained this connection, even though we didn't live in the same town anymore. We had maintained this. Whenever we got together, it was the same kind of instant oneness mm -hmm. between us. Very beautiful. So he died in 2002 from a drug overdose. Hmm. It was Fun, very funny. I was thinking that might be what it was, but I didn't hadn't even asked you. But yeah, somehow that yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so I had uh, two children at the time, a five year old and a three year old. And when I when I um, in my bio I always say that um, several traumatic events happened in a year's time. This is the year's time that I'm speaking about. Mm -hmm. So first, um, the kid's father left. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, and he, he came, I just have to say he came to be with the kids. But in essence, I was single parenting for the next five years. And um, so he left. My brother died three months later. And then my I was with my father when he died nine months after that. Mm. So... But what happened when my brother died is that I made a vow in order to, I made a vow to, um, to find out where he went. Mm -hmm. It was so important for me. And, and I can tell you, Rick, that right when my brother died, immediately I asked all the, those beings who had been so informing my life and making it um, making it so that I could really be here, actually, because I think being here is pretty hard for someone who's really sensitive, for all of us, really, right? Mm -hmm. So it was making it so that I could be here in a, in a way. So I asked them to all take a hike. Huh, interesting. Some some people might think you would have asked them where your brother went. Is he with you, <laughs> is he with you guys? Where'd he go? <laughs> I, was, I was pissed. No. I was pissed, and I was, well, I was just incredibly... Um, I felt incredibly let down because I don't know it was some kind of really naive, innocent um, understanding of 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 what this world is about. That you could be protected in any kind of way mm. from um, the harshness of of these kind of you know mm. uncompromising realities. There's no going back, right? Right. Death. Boom. <laughs> so so when he died. Um, I asked them to take a hike, and, and within right away, they were gone. They're like, well, where did they go, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of my dream life, I had no more dreams. I mean, it was just astounding, the, the, um, the black and whiteness. So I was sobered <laughs> up, and like, I landed on this, on this planet, finally, a Mother Earth, in a more solid way, but with, without any kind of... Um, protection between myself and and reality so did you feel like you had lost something then or did you feel like you'd been snapped out of a sort of a um an imaginary kind of realm that you sh that it was good to have been have left no i didn't feel like i lost anything i was i didn't want it felt like it sobered up in a way mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and and now i we can talk later about how i feel about it now mm -hmm. but but then it was just that's what i wanted i wanted and to just I just wanted to have the pure experience, unadulterated, of um, of being here. But I was I was overcome with grief. I mean, it, really, it took several years for, and still happens, where the the realization of boom, he's really gone, or you know, reality really meeting me, me meeting reality here like that, mm -hmm. you know, without any kind of gap or imagination in between. So really, you know, imagination in a certain sense died, hope. Um, so do you think all those beings and whatnot were imaginary or just some actual, but or real but subtle? Um, I don't think they were imaginary like, um, like, like I, I made it up, but it was... It was intangible, but doesn't mean it's imagination. Subtle. Subtle, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, celestial beings are not concrete, physical, blood and bones yeah. enti entities. They're made of subtler stuff. Right, right, right. Right. So I, I, I don't mean to say that they're imaginary, but maybe what I did with it mm -hmm. created more imagination as if it would mm -hmm. protect me from life. Like you were kind of taking refu buffer. refuge in that realm and not fully coming to terms with this one. 
Right. So it was like a buffer. It was a it was a, a sweet buffer. Yeah. And I I didn't want to be you know protected anymore on a certain mm-hmm. level. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, and who knows, right? Do they really go anywhere? Do they really stop? being a part of your life what's just that's all imagination i don't know but yeah. the experience was it was like um an honoring of what i was wanting and but really it's 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 like intelligence once again was stepping in and saying you know the way to realization and i you know i didn't know this at the time it was completely intuitive that the way to realization is through stripping away beliefs mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so... And assumptions, and... Yeah, right. Right. So, platforms of belief, you know, that the mind rests on. Yeah, and I think in your book you, you use the word either deconstruction or demolition. <laughs> that it can, uh-huh. ha- it can happen piece by piece, carefully, or it can be one of those big explosions where the building just collapses. Uh-huh, yeah, it was like that. It was like somebody pulled... <laughs> One piece that was very vital, and the house building of, house of cards kind of thing. Completely, and um, yeah. so you know, later I find myself being incredibly grateful mm-hmm. for the experience, just wishing that it didn't come at such a price. You know, yeah. yeah. So you're kind of saying that your brother's death, your father's death, and uh, and your partner's departure, those were the the thing that pulled the the critical card and and, the, and so these external events shocked you into some different sort of orientation to life yeah shock is a good point mm-hmm. yeah that's that's a good way to put it um so i was in shock mm-hmm. i was in shock and i um but slowly the fog of um being in shock started to lift and and seeing things as they probably are more truly began to take form Mm. and um, I actually didn't want to even go see Amma for a couple years maybe it was a year so I just felt like letting it all go and just being with myself really stepping back into myself and being really honest while I was parenting these two small children Mm. and uh, a year after that occurred I met Adya Shanti Mm -hmm. And the um, meeting him was very helpful for me because I didn't want another teacher that I felt put more put a layer of 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 um, I don't know let's not put it that way but um, who was who was so sober in his teaching in their yeah. teaching I needed someone who didn't. Uh, it, even talk about the mystical realm so much. I just right. needed some sober teachings, and uh, because I was I was totally ready. I didn't even know that I, wa- I wanted to have another teacher. That someone took me to see Adya, and um, I was living in um, Marin at the time. Yeah. So you met Adya, mm-hmm. and yeah. So. Uh, whew. Got all these memories, huh? Uh-huh. Going back in time. So, at the time, I started to. My mind was was very active with trying to un to to figure things out or undo itself. It was like uh, the way I I felt it. It was like this Rubik's cube. You know, it was just mm, spinning around. Going, doing that thing. Yeah, yeah, have you heard of that before? <laughs> well, I've cer- certainly heard of Rubik's Cubes, and I've yeah, seen, yeah, yeah. seen people who can solve them in 15 seconds or something. They just go <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what my mind was doing. Yeah. It, w- it was happening at night at the expense of my sleep, you know, because I had, mm. was taking care of the kids in the day. And so two things were going on in my life. I was a mother, a single mom to these two kids, and luckily kids of that age, it, it's pretty simple and and. and uh, you don't have to think and talk too much, because I was really slowed down. Hmm. I was very slowed down, <laughs> and um, and then the other thing that was going on was just like I was just fascinated by materiality, hmm. and I would stare at like simple things like lamps. <laughs> I wanted to like know the essence of things, and um, 
So the so this Rubik's cube was going on, and then the complete ne- uh, simplicity of essence was re- starting to reveal itself to the point where the um, I I didn't even know it then, but now I can describe it as like emptiness started to to reveal itself. Do you feel like it had already kind of revealed itself? within you like some kind of abstract on some kind of abstract inner level and that your fascination with material objects such as lamps and trying to find the essence in, in them was a fur, was a kind of an expansion of that inner realization or mm. or did the outer did the thing with lamps at, using that as an example no, come yeah. first no that's that's really insightful i think that's probably what what was happening is that mm-hmm. the the inner understanding because one thing I didn't mention um, earlier is that when my brother died and I made a vow to, to discover where he went, mm-hmm. I actually, at night, was taken on a journey with his, with his um, traveling with his soul or his, or his essence into um, these different dimensions. And until the point came when he disappeared. Because mm, you couldn't go that far couldn't go that far but but part of me went that far hmm. and um, it it was like a three week or, or longer process and I remembered feeling oh he's gone hmm. it's oh it's gone you know that almost as trace. if you were in some kind of transitionary realm or something and then you could right. you could sort of accompany him in that realm but at yeah. a certain point he had to go on well and I and I felt myself go on with him to a point, so becoming less and less, um, more and more subtle. Mm-hmm. So the so the so the so the 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 whatever was of him of Daniel was becoming less and less until it disappeared. And after that, there was a part of me that felt like I was dead too. Hmm. Interesting. Like I had gone into, and for I could even say that there was a part that I felt like I had one foot that was in death. Mm-hmm. So there was. L- one foot in life and one foot that was in the beyond. But uh, that, to me, that doesn't have a negative connotation. You know, it's almost like you, you were kind of the, uh, sort of that other dimension was enlivened in your experience by virtue of his death. Yeah, no, it it, it doesn't. And, and that's an, and that's a really good perspective to have, actually. <laughs> <laughs> in this kind of stuff, yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, I, I sat with a friend who died, you know, about a month ago, and meditated with his body for a while and all, and and afterwards, and even ever since, even now, there's this sense that this, it changed my perspective. I could understand why yogis would meditate in cremation grounds and stuff. It just mm. there's there's a sort of kind of a locked in assumption that we have ordinarily in life where we feel like you know we're going to live forever or something and that this is this is all there is and then when a person leaves and you realize oh well that animating spirit that was making this body move and talk and speak that's gone where did it go like you're saying with your brother and yeah. and and you begin to see everyone as basically dead people who just still still have their animating spirit there <laughs> but that's that's going to leave you know in a matter of decades or days yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And and so there's a part of us that is, you know, dead already. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. So that's how 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 I felt on the, the inside. The, the grateful dead, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty Yeah, I was just about dancing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um So when you uh, sorry to interrupt but um mm-hmm. you you kind of alluded to the idea that Emptiness or or the absolute value had actually dawned uh, somehow or other as a result of all these tragedies, but you didn't quite make that explicitly clear. But you just implied that that's what had actually happened. Everything had been stripped away, and you'd kind of gotten grounded in the real world. But it's almost it sounds like you're saying that somehow or other that was the time at which you really kind of came home to absolute realization. Also, yeah, and. Uh I wasn't reflecting on it, so I didn't have um, awareness of it. Mm-hmm. It was just this deep um, sense mm-hmm. of of, um, and I and it was prior to meeting Adya, so I didn't have any words for it. Mm. Yeah. But when you met Adya and the whole thing matured a little bit, you kind of realized, in retrospect, that this is what had happened. 
Yeah, but it's not over yet. It's like it was. Right, a, right. What I don't even mean presently. <laughs> I just meant then. Yeah. Um, so the the like you were pointing to that the the awareness of emptiness had had already been seen to some major degree mm -hmm. without the ability to self reflect on it. It was just mm. there. Then the next step for me was seeing it in uh, in the outside. Right. And so the lamp and the cars, I would, I, when the kids were in, in their schools, I would park um, my car in Fairfax, California, and just watch, fascinated, Pe you know, just people walking by and cars driving by, and I was in bliss. I mean, literally, I was just in bliss with, but what it felt like, it wasn't in technical, it wasn't in color anymore, it was... Shades of gray were appearing, two but two dimensional rather than three. Hmm. Things were becoming more flat, hmm. and uh, color was 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 leaving. And it wasn't at all times I could still function, but it was as if the what I had, you know, and I didn't even know this then, but what I had infused life into with my own awareness, you know, putting life, uh, seeing things as real started to return and the ephemeral nature of things started to reveal themselves. The fact that it's uh, just, uh, a, I don't know how to describe it because I didn't think about it that back then. All I knew is that I was, it was such a relief. So is that what you mean by shades of gray and, mm -hmm. and, and flat, two-dimensional? It's that the life which you had attributed to those things was no longer there it was it was like it was returning back the the the, the meaning and the substance that mm -hmm. that things contain were were being seen things were being seen more for what they really are yeah and uh, it was reflecting back as visual i don't know huh. yeah S yeah so literally you were seeing things more in shades of gray and, and two dimensional it's not just a metaphor you yeah yeah and did that continue in that sense, or did, did you, was that just a phase? It was a phase. Yeah. 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 Because I would say that you know you could say that, but on the other hand, everything is completely saturated with intelligence and you know the divine quality, divine nature, and so you know the, the tiniest little stone on the ground is like this miraculous you know thing throbbing with life, uh, and 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 it isn't meaningless. But maybe that's. Um, well, there are stages. So, if you really, yeah. for in order to to realize emptiness, um, what 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 occurs, mm -hmm. it's different for everyone. Yeah. And in my case, the way that it occurred was that meaning was returned back to the source that imagined it to be real. Yeah, well, that really makes sense to me, and it actually jibes with traditional explanations that have you know that I've read and heard where you do go through a phase of flatness and where the outer like, world or yeah where the outer world just seems sort of I don't know if dead but you know kind of meaningless flat devoid of any of significance or whatever and uh, but then eventually appreciation begins to dawn more and more and uh, there's a whole new richness that every that everything is seen in terms of you know and that just continues to grow yeah, so so just to make it more rich. So mm -hmm. what happened <laughs> is that I um so right following that, I had this beautiful experience at, in Point Reyes at the ocean where I had some time to myself which didn't occur very often. When suddenly the waves and the sand and myself and the, so oneness st stepped in. Mm. And uh awareness of, my, of, of being part of every single thing emerged, okay? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the richness and the stone and every particle being it, it's absolutely true. So, so, so the life came back, rushing back in, full of, you know, yeah. wonder and, and yeah. um, vitality and color and beauty. So much so <laughs> that I, I became... Uh, kind of drunk on mm -hmm. it you know mm -hmm. the 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 person who who has discovered you know the you know oneness and all that but um so 
really truthfully, in a way, I can say that's never re- left. Since Point Reyes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's become. It, of course, it became normalized. Right. And everything, everything does. It took several years, mm-hmm. and for the for for about a year, I could actually talk about it or so, and after that. I couldn't even reflect on any of it. I couldn't reflect on the emptiness for a few years. I couldn't refl- I couldn't speak about it. Every time I thought about it or tried to think about it, it would just I would just like go into some kind of stupid zone. You know, I can't. I You're can't, doing pretty well right now. Well, no, it's it, it's, <laughs> it's coming back. The ability oh. to speak about it. I see. Yeah, all this to me seems very natural, and you know it's going to be a little bit different for different people. But mm-hmm. it's it's completely natural that we go through these phases of, you know, inability to speak and integration and you know, familiarization, acclimation to to these different stages of development. Well, you have the, you have um, you know so much experience and people you've interviewed that you have that awareness, but I didn't really have. Um, Kind of on your own. Yeah, yeah, I was on my own, but I did, you know, I, I was uh, connected to the Sangha with uh, Adya. Right, so that must have helped a lot. It helped a lot. So, you know, the it is wonderful to have a teacher and to have Sangha, you mm-hmm. know, who who um, confirm and, and uh, understand this kind of thing that we're speaking about. Yeah. It was invaluable, really, for me. Really helped it to stabilize. And to um, to not question it one bit, mm. to have no doubt whatsoever that this was exactly what needed to happen. So I had the the context, I had the the container mm-hmm. to be able to hold me in a beautiful kind of way. Even though I, I don't know, you know, you know who Adya is, of course. Mm-hmm. He doesn't. He doesn't babysit people, so it was more an abstract container. But for me, it was what I, enough of a container. Oh, he's a good container. And a large part of his role seems to be dealing with post-awakening issues. Yeah. You know, I mean, if we want to demarcate a particular thing as awakening, because you could probably draw that line in a number of places. But uh, you know, basically. This coming home, self-realization kind of thing that we're talking about. A lot of what he he deals with seems to be post that sort of awakening, because yeah. because uh, you know it's it's not all peaches and cream necessarily after that awakening. There's a lot yet to unfold and and explore mm-hmm. and understand and and so on. And we, and we need teachers who specialize in that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And then at some point. Uh, Six years ago, or something like that, I stopped going to see Adya, mm-hmm. and I, uh, in fact, at one of the volunteer meetings that they used to have, um, these volunteer satsangs, uh, he he told me that I didn't need to come anymore. Mm. You know, just so I took him to heart. I took that. I was a very good student. <laughs> Were you in the least bit upset by that, or you figured he you knew where he was coming from? Oh no, it seemed right. I, yeah, no, I wasn't yeah. upset, but it was a um, it was a letting go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a graduation that you know took some time to to acclimate to because I moved from Marin to Nevada County here in mm-hmm. you know in California, and I left the sangha. I left my volunteer position in the organization, the you know open mm-hmm. gate organization, and I just went cold turkey, which. Came to a community who didn't I didn't at first didn't connect with on that level. Right. So I really stepped out into into the unknown within myself because in in the end that's what we have to do anyway. Mm-hmm. We can't self ref we can't re- refer anymore to what the teacher's saying to it really needs to be lived. Mm. Yeah. Have you had a teacher in any formal sense since Aja? Mm-mm. Yeah. What's your experience when you go to Siyama now? Because you resume going to Siyama, I guess, with your daughter or something. Yeah. So uh, after, so a year after this occurred with my brother, I, I went to Siyama and I had the most beautiful experience with her. I I took a picture of my brother with me mm-hmm. to have her bless, and she asked her Swami, you know, the big guy. Right, big, big Swami. Big Swami. So she asked Swami what happened to. Mm-hmm. 
you know, to my brother, and I told him, and she she got this um, look on her face that truthfully just disma- took about 50% or more away of my grief just mm-hmm. by seeing the the um her the reflection that she gave me of total um dismay mm-hmm. pain um i know you know it was just like the it was life reflecting back to me how i felt or the or the truth of the matter of how tragic it was so she gave me this reflection on on her face yeah and just to ha- be met in that way was was incredibly powerful it's interesting how ama doesn't just sort of brush things off as you know with some kind of philosophical attitude and she really feels people's grief she does she uh, penetrates uh, everything yeah i mean i i was uh, just recently i was sitting just a few feet away from her and a woman came up who had a broken leg and she told this whole story to Amma about her her husband had abused her and you know all this terrible stuff and Amma was just like crying you know tears coming down her face and she you know just consoling this woman and all so it's the whole notion that we become sort of aloof in some cosmic uh, la la land <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> dismissed, is dismissed by her example yeah exactly yeah. so I'm so grateful to to her and to the experience that a and experiences that I've had with mm-hmm. her. What is your experience now when you go to see her? I, this is, you know, I, I, the, this interview is about you, and we're not just going to be talking about Ama, but I'm, yeah. interest, I'm interested in what, you know, in, you know, you, you in a relatively awakened condition, what influence um, someone someone might ask, well, why would you bother to go see Ama now, aside from your daughter's interest? But secondly, for your own purpose, what what is the uh, influence or impact or, or effect on your inner experience uh, or your inner development as a result of that association? Yeah, well, I, I don't see um, her as outside of myself. Mm-hmm. So going to see her is going to see an aspect of myself that is just like, to me, a huge container. Yeah. A huge container of what's possible mm-hmm. with um, the the things that she does, what she's capable of, um, the love and the the work that she does um, and gives to the world. So for me to go see her is just I, there's it's just this being meeting that being, mm-hmm. and um, in gratitude I just feel I feel gratitude and love and appreciation and um, and it's it's like a yearly pilgrimage that I do with my kids and last time with my daughter they love my daughter now because my son's 16 so right he has other things to do but she she still really loves going to see ama and uh <laughs> I mean, it's just one little story an ama story mm-hmm. so when gaia my daughter was nine she's four, gonna be 14 we went to go see ama and um my daughter was acting out a lot to uh her teachers and and acting out a lot to me, doing a very uh, pushing away kind of, and uh, she wasn't contented inside. So we went to go see Ama, and Ama, you know, Guy has been seeing her since she was in the womb, but Ama took one look at her and <laughs> and bit her <laughs> on her cheek, <laughs> pretty hard. Uh-huh. And so my daughter walked away and said. Ama bit me, and there were some, some marks, you know, I mean, not hard, hard. And she looked so blissful. And um, Rick, her her attitude completely changed. Her teacher saw all this change in her. She was a new person, and the way that I see it is that Gaia was um, trying to be the pack leader. Hmm. She was. She's a very uh, kind of uh, strong leader type of girl. Mm-hmm. And she was trying to be the pack leader, and she wasn't satisfied with what she was m- finding in me as her mom or with her teachers. It just wasn't doing the trick, you know, putting... But Amma saw what was needed, you know, mm-hmm. and put her, you know, the divine did, did, did what an alpha dog would do to establish pack exactly. leadership. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. the divine is in charge, mm-hmm. not you. And, and pff, she was... 
it, it's it's it changed it changed everything. That is so interesting. That's an interesting topic that we could talk about. Is you know, life lived with the divine in charge, mm -hmm. and how things happen that you would never have been able to figure out or determine, okay, I think I'll bite this girl in the cheek or, you know, whatever. Uh, but th there's this kind of spontaneity that works out in kind of miraculous ways sometimes. It's true, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's in charge regardless whether we are aware of it or not. Or whether, even if we see, think we're getting in its way, it's in charge. Yeah. Like when I was at the AMA thing in uh, Chicago just now, I, I noticed the car parked next to me and the lot had its lights on. Mm -hmm. And so as I was walking back to the hall, I thought, I, I want to meet the person who owns that car and so I can tell him about his lights. And now I'm going to just drop this desire and let it, you know, let it just happen if it's meant to happen. So I went into the men's room. And the guy standing next to me at the next urinal was a friend of mine. And I said, hey, do you know anybody who has a Honda Civic with such and such license plates? And he said, that's my car. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he went out and turned off his lights. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, synchronicity at the ur urinals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was this, another little story. There was a, the Swami told this story about this woman in Munich or some, some village several hours from Munich and she she was you know single mom no money uh, somehow scraped you know, barely enough money for food somehow scraped uh, jobless somehow scraped enough money for train fare to come and see Ama mm -hmm. and she, uh, she so she got there and she told Ama her plight through a translator and Ama said come back tonight she said I can't come back tonight because I, I have a, I'm committed to this train ticket. I, I, I'll forfeit it, and I don't have enough money to buy another one. But somehow she just, you know, so the Swami double-checked. Amma said, tell her to come back tonight. So f she did it. She came back in the evening, and there was when she came back, there was some guy standing by the couch who was some kind of a businessman who happened to live in her town back there, wherever that town was. And Amma looked at the guy, and she said, can you give him her a job? And the guy said, "Yeah, as a matter of fact, I you know I need to hire somebody." And so it all worked out. Oh she my. got she, <laughs> and Amma, you know, Amma didn't even know this person or the guy or anything else. It just all somehow clicked together. Gorgeous, huh? <laughs> Talk about a big container. <laughs> yeah, and and which kind of leads us, you know, we can sit, we can play with this some more because you you talk a lot in the things you sent me that we talked about that I read about how we're, you know we're we're really not this little pinpoint. You know, of of an individual that we think we are, we're, we're cosmic intelligence. The individual is cosmic, right. a and there's so much that can be appreciated when you, uh, you know, kind of dwell on that experience mm -hmm. and understanding. And maybe why don't you? T I've been talking too much. Why don't you talk about that concept <laughs> a little bit? Oh, but you're entertaining. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the way that um, I describe it is that. Uh, and maybe you've heard of this analogy before, that um, that the the experience of being an I is the is 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 like the pinprick. Mm -hmm. It's this um, narrowed down uh, lens, really, of consciousness. It narrows itself down to a point, and it knows itself in, in the minuscule. So you know, in the particle, in the rock, in the cell, in the most tiny experiences of you know phenomenon and that includes the sense of I mm -hmm. and then it has the capacity to open itself up more the lens of consciousness to include more and more of itself to include um, awareness of its of the body of its surroundings to to forget this pinpoint point you know of an I to include more and more you can say that could be imagination, but truthfully, where does consciousness go? It goes where you pay attention to, what you pay attention to. So if you're paying attention to the whole, more and more of the whole, the experience is being aware of the whole. Is that kind of what you're yeah. pointing to in terms of, mm -hmm. yeah? And, um, and the way I see it is that you know, we, we embody cosmic principles. And the, there's this principle of individuation and specification that really is necessary for there to be a universe. You know, this kind of the amorphous stuff of which the universe is made congealed and, and, uh, and individuated into, you know, s 
specific molecules and those molecules organize themselves into bodies and you know those bodies you know regard themselves as having very you know small identities compared to the vastness of the whole but um there's there's a kind of a counterbalancing principle which is that you know as you refer to it often in the stuff that you write of c kind of wanting to come back to source mm -hmm. uh so there's this kind of whole you know cycle uh, from here all the way through this back to here, you mm -hmm. know, for, from I all the way through individuate and all the sort of back to I. Mm -hmm. And I was discussing this with a friend and we were saying, you know, what force could be adequately powerful or alluring to counterbalance this this tendency toward individuation and towards, you know, outer directed attention, which seems to be driving everything. Mm -hmm. and, and that force is bliss. You know, mm -hmm. inner. It's it's sort of sufficiently um, attractive to the mind that mm -hmm. it can take it all the way home. Mm, that's sweet. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. It it melts that um, individu individuated sense of I, doesn't it? The bliss. Yeah. There's that saying: contact with Brahman is infinite joy. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is that. Um, that awareness, um, whatever word you want to use, God, or mm -hmm. has the capacity to be a pinprick of, of a sense of I, as well as have that sense of bliss at the same time. Simultaneously, yes. Yeah. So it has the capacity to be all of itself. So that's, that's what realization really is, is when mm -hmm. awareness wakes up to itself and it's not glued to its identification with form anymore or with thought, you know, diffused form. Yeah, and, and sometimes it seems to be presented as a com that that it's going to be a complete loss of I, you know, a complete loss of individuation. Mm -hmm. But personally, I don't understand how living would be possible if that were the case. There, there needs to be the whole spectrum there, um, as as you put in something you wrote. You need to know, you know, whose mouth to put the food in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> It's just it's just uh, stories that we tell, you know, or that have been told of how it's supposed to look, you know. Mm -hmm. But to function here, you know, and to, to move through the world and to know yourself as that more and more fully in everything that you do, in, in every object, that, that is the ongoing, you know, embodiment that takes place that's never ending. Yeah, um, you said here, the maturation of that takes the rest of one's life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't see how there can be an end to it. it. You know, I mean, look at somebody like Amma as an example. Are we there yet in terms of the, the, you know, the degree to which we're embodying and yeah. expressing that? Well, maybe not. So, yeah. And and every life form is going to have its own unique expression, right? Right, right. We're not all going to end up like that. No, and no. and the comparison mind really, really, well, s yeah, s slows down and and. Um, appreciation for for what is in the moment contained in the moment and knowing that everything that is contained in the moment is is that is is brahman it's god mm -hmm. every single thing you know from the microcosmic to the macrocosmic including thoughts <laughs> yeah um but nonetheless it seems like you know there is this evolutionary force which never quits mm -hmm. you know it just keeps refining and you know uh, expanding and you know en engulfing and you know it's like this kind <laughs> of amoeba which just keeps eating things up <laughs> in fact there's yeah. a there's a saying brahman is the eater of everything yeah bon appetit mm. you know <laughs> <laughs> huh. everything is delicious mm. you know everything is delicious so um but it's there's something that, as you know, there's something that remains the same, right? Yep. That is the same in the midst of its growing and its expansion and its deeper, more deeply understanding itself in in every single being, every single thing. There's something that's the same. Yeah. 
Maharshi Mahesh Yogi used to talk in terms of the circumference growing, that things are first seen in terms of the self, in terms of your primary object of perception, and then the circumference just continues to grow and grow and grow until it sort of incorporates the whole universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then you can be that single solitary object, and there's, no, there's nothing that's be being lost. It mm. knows itself there. So it knows itself there in the midst of the growing, growing, growing. So when we come back to, when I think about my childhood, that awareness wasn't, wasn't there yet. It got lost. Right. It got lost in, in the maya, in the dream, the, the, the growing of <laughs> consciousness. You know, It was mm -hmm. beyond what it had known before. And it got lost again, seemingly, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is all well and good, natural. Yeah, who's making it wrong? <laughs> Another thing, Marshy, one time he was sat, sitting in front of a group and he said, um, who among you is a walking universe? Mm. And a friend of mine got up <laughs> and said, that's my experience. And Marshy said, is it flat or is it lively? He said, it's lively. He said, that's it. Mm. <laughs> and in fact, you say here, when the return is done here, it continues to write itself, to unite itself as others because it has seen that there are no others. So mm -hmm. again, it's this sort of metaphor of an amoeba that's kind of continuing to incorporate more and more into itself and, and, until the whole universe is yeah. contained. It's, it's interesting how, how, how delicious it is to um, imagine that or to, to know that, mm -hmm. you know, because just talking about it feels good. Yeah. It feels good just talking about how, how vast we are. Hmm. People have heard me say this before, but I always use pictures of galaxies as my screensaver on my computer. So as I'm talking to you, I see a galaxy here. And I was wondering <laughs> all the imagery was coming from, yeah. It fascinates me because you, you get a sense of, when you look at presentations on astronomy and see pictures of galaxies, you just get a sense of the vastness, you know. And, um, and you know, you can imagine how infinitesimal the life forms in that galaxy are and and if that's all that one thinks one is that little tiny tiny like you said before a pinprick i think you said um you know what sort of life is that compared to the, the possibility of living as as the vastness yeah yeah and then never being afraid again of being a pinprick mm -hmm. you know that that is that's also bliss being that just that point that reference point the point Mm -hmm. Because that contains the whole. It does. They they speak of the holographic universe, you know, and how the part contains the whole. What you know, what is here is everywhere. Yeah. Um, but like you said, when you when you think of when the eye believes in itself and it feels like it is that the whole, you know, mm -hmm. and it doesn't know anything other. The the it's just suffering ensues. It doesn't have, um, it can't reference itself. Yeah. And again, when you say that, I think, yeah, you're right, but it's natural. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's not like anybody's done anything wrong. Although sometimes this is referred to as uh, pragya parat, the, the mistake of the intellect. So, it's, you know, it's, it's a mistake, but it's not a mistake one was capable of not making. You know, it's just the sort of course of evolution is such that we, we get down to the, the point value. Mm -hmm. And then from there we we come back to the the wholeness. Exactly. There's intelligence there. It mm. can't help but be. And there's innocence, complete innocence, in all of it. So um, being lost in the sense of of being an I and not even knowing it is a completely innocent thing. Beginning to be aware of it, probably more suffering ensues when you start to become aware of it in a way. Um, but all of it is innocent. Hmm. That's how I see it. We're innocent. Yeah. There's this whole concept of original sin and all that stuff is a little heavy handed. <laughs> well, when you say that there's no mistake, you know. Right. Um, all is well and wisely put. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean that the world couldn't use a good dose of, of uh, remembering. <laughs> You know, in terms of um, things the way that things are going environmentally and, and such. Mm. You know? S seems to be getting that. 
Yeah. From what I can tell, you know, I mean, it's it's as if the the sort of consciousness were rising to meet the challenge that has been presented by mm-hmm. kind of inordinate fascination with point value, with mater- <laughs> ma- material value. Exactly. So it's like, like it's a balance. It's swung as far as it can swing in the, in one right. direction without dire consequences, and so it's starting to swing back. Yeah, the way I see it is everything born returns back to source. Mm-hmm. So the the birth, the sense of the I has its has its life when you know it it's born and then it has its livingness. It doesn't feel right anymore. It starts to question itself. Right, this is all consciousness's journey, and mm-hmm. then it returns back to itself and remembers itself, and then it does this whole thing consciously. Yeah. So so hopefully. You're right that the pendulum is swinging to a place where, en masse, we can be doing that. You mm-hmm. know, and you sitting there doing these interviews, you probably have more of a sense of it than I do about how how much um, awareness is starting to take place. You know, within the population. Well, I do have 860 people on the waiting list. Uh, you know, new recommendations coming in oh every day. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I, I don't think I would have had that in 1955 or something. Um, oh, that's beautiful. You know, because in that, at that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, there just wasn't that much appreciation of this sort of thing. And and who knows? I mean, maybe there were. I'm sure there were awakenings happening here and there, but now it seems more epidemic. Yeah. I mean, the. I think that's what the invitation is for, for what what I'm offering too, mm-hmm. in terms of my sharings. It's just this. Um, the the one thing that I feel like I can offer, really, you know. Yeah. What do you offer, and and to whom, and how? Well, it's very small scale right now. So, mm-hmm. and it's 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 all organic. The way that that I move is is through authenticity so being invited on the show you know this is what I'm doing right now and um, I have two sat songs a month that I lead and sometimes I invite teachers to join in in your the, area there in Nevada mm-hmm. City area okay. yeah uh-huh. yeah and then I work one-on-one with individuals who who would like to you know um, over over Skype or telephone, many or on Skype and yeah. uh, then one on one, yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, in yeah. Person. yeah. Well, sometimes people experience what I call the bat gap bump, which is <laughs> you need to do one of these interviews and it picks up the pace a bit in terms of inquiries and yeah. and and so uh, you know, do you charge money for these uh, sessions? You must need to support yourself. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I I'd like to have an energy exchange. It feels fair to me, mm-hmm. you know, because I'm a single mom still, you know, right. raising these two kids. So, mm-hmm. um, it, I have a sliding scale, so I won't turn people away. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. And um, typically, let's say. Let's say I were to have some Skype sessions with you. What would you do with me, and what would I get from it? And would I ha- would I learn techniques, or would I just talk to you, or what would happen? Well, it it just depends on what you're bringing, you know. Mm-hmm. So techniques they come in the moment. So it's a very intuitive um, thing that arises. So an, an understanding and a knowing of what's needed seems to arise. So. Um, I can't. I can't describe it to you, Rick. So, it's it's so really. It's not, a, it's not a cut and dried path sort of system. No, it's, it's of sort of organic, as you yeah, say. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, it's more a felt a felt thing, and mm-hmm. and insight comes. You know, it, this connection that we're really not separate emerges. Right. And so, what's needed, and what the other person may not even know for themselves necessarily, but it's always done in a kind way with with love. Um, emerges and so that's how I see it it's very organic and tends to go on for a while an hour to an hour and a half um, it's generally what I what I do yeah and do you have people that tend to you know call you back uh, a number of times yeah so? yeah uh-huh. luckily yeah <laughs> and do, do they report any sort of um, transformations as a result of this 
Well, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not setting out with a goal in mind. It's, it's kind of unique. It's kind of different, you know, to, to be working with others without this, without this idea that something really needs to happen. Right. It's, it's coming out of love and it's com- coming out of truthfulness in the moment. Mm-hmm. So wherever the other person is willing to meet me is what ends up happening, however deep someone wants to go. Mm. So in terms of people coming back, I, yeah, I have people who are coming back. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, as long as as long as they feel compelled to come back, I, I welcome it. You know? Sure. Yeah. So I get the sense that you kind of are able to tune into people where they're at, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and then you just take it from there. Yeah, I think that's probably you know the the gift that that life has given me. Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of an offering. Mm-hmm. I feel like we all have gifts and we all have offerings. Yeah. And so the gift that life has given me, and probably because of my, you know, my whole past, it's it's exactly what it is that I did for myself. I don't know how to do anything differently than that. I don't know how to do something out in the world and become something other than offering this gift of, of what it is that I feel like I received, mm-hmm. that was received. And that's this, this impulse. And it's really, it's coming naturally and organically. It, it's, it seems seamless to me. Yeah. No, I, I'm sure it does, and I'm sure it is. Um, I mean, if one is functioning as you are functioning, then it can't be anything but a kind of a spontaneous expression of you know, cosmic intelligence, to use that phrase. Yeah. There's just, we're all kind of, I think you said, uh, what did you say, sense organs of consciousness or something. We're all like little puppets of the infinite <laughs> right. playing our roles. And, and uh, the more fully we cooperate with that, then the the more, I guess, the more f- uh, effective we can be in, a, a, as instruments of the divine. Yeah, it just you know when when the when you're out of the way because you see that you don't even exist. Exactly. I, when what's I, operating? You know? Yeah. When I said cooperate, then the next thought was out of the way. You know. That, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, and I'm I'm happy to work with people who haven't realized the seen through the eye. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy, and I, and from the spectrum of of that, who are still seekers, so to speak, mm. to the spectrum of that they are finders, but are integrating it. Yeah. Because I have been integrating it for eight years now, mm-hmm. and so there's an, um, and it's still integrating. Sure. You know. I like can talk to you 20 about. years from now, and it probably still will <laughs> will be. Yeah. So yeah. It, I just love that, you know, that yeah. it uh, keeps growing. Yeah. <laughs> the understanding that where the whole keeps keeps happening. It's like the blob. That was yeah, before right. before your time, but back in the fifties, there was this horror movie called The Blob. Oh, and it I was remember just, it. You remember that? <laughs> I was. Uh, that was my first fear. Like I, I got afraid of the blob. I saw the blob. <laughs> I was so scared. And now I welcome the blob, right? Yeah. Like, you know, more and more and more. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just mentioned the word seeking, and I I, want, I made a note to talk to you about that too. Um, Seeking sort of has a negative connotation in some spiritual circles, but I mean, my attitude toward it is just that it's natural, like everything is natural. And at a certain point, the whole seeking flavor kind of relaxes because I guess there's been sufficient finding, and you know, one no 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 longer feels that desperation and that yearning and and so on, or that emptiness. But there's still no never-ending fascination with discovery, and you know, it's, it turns into more of an exploration than a than a desperate yeah, quest. Exactly. Yeah. Seeking is just a longing for, for ourselves. Yeah. So we're longing for ourselves. And we at some point, probably very starting very young, we put it outside of ourselves. Our, we put ourselves outside of ourselves and we try mm-hmm. to regain it. We put it in objects, we put it in um, uh, the people, you know, we're wanting confirmation. So seeking is really a longing to come back home and so it's actually when you talk about natural you know and innocent well you know so many people put seeking as with this with this bad like you say bad connotation but really it's that it's that outwardness that outward momentum that was put by consciousness out into the world to know itself to understand and differentiate itself Mm. and it gets lost there apparently yeah 
And then it longs, at some point, that return, everything born, returns back to itself. So seeking, when it's put in, in its rightful place, you know, because you know how many ways people can seek. Sure. Right? Well, I mean, you can seek through faster cars and, you know, right. flashier. Right, and you don't even know that. All that stuff. Yeah, so <laughs> what, I, what I say is that um, the... the um, the best use of spirituality in terms of seeking is being able to discover some, some good truths that actually point you back mm -hmm. home and point to the fact that, this, that really where you, what, is, what you're looking for resides right here. Yeah. So in the end, that seeking energy can be fuel, can be used as fuel you know, to, to return back home. It doesn't have to be... Uh, seen in a in any kind of way that's not useful and in fact what can you do can you really stop seeking when you're a seeker yeah really I mean, yeah good, good just point. like say you know i'm gonna stop <laughs> because i heard that that it, you shouldn't be seeking you know yeah there's a sort of an indian story about how the king can never be comfortable until he sits on his throne he can't sit in any other chair and he's just going to keep wandering until he finds his throne that that's where he's supposed to sit and so you know the mind uh, is always just it's going to be restless until it finds that which can really satisfy it, it which yeah. is you know the abs the be being the absolute whatever that that's the one thing um, and you, you said an interesting phrase the mind will take you to the gate but not beyond but at least it can do that you know, it can yeah. it. and then right. you know once it's taken us to the gate there's a certain momentum that just carries us beyond exactly and that's the seeking yeah. You know, the seeking can take you to the gate. That's part of the mind, wanting mm -hmm. to find peace. Because the mind is, 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 when it's in that seeking mode, it's just like, you know, give me, give me something to stop this restless mind. Yeah. And this outwardness has got to end. It's causing so much suffering. And even when you realize that the, the, the goal is within, that it's not to be found in outward things, it doesn't mean you just get to it just like that. I mean, and it doesn't. Also, it also doesn't mean you're a neophyte if you have a seeking energy. I mean, look at someone like Ama. She she like almost threw herself in the ocean and drowned herself because her desperation for for God was so intense, and and she just couldn't tolerate living in the world without satisfying that <laughs> that need. You know. Uh, so sometimes you read of you know very advanced souls who became great saints who were just on fire with de yeah. determination to to realize god and uh you know so you could you could say they were seeking in, 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 to an to a very in, incredible degree well yeah i mean <laughs> i <laughs> i mean yeah the the for me as well the seeking was intense yeah. like after you know my brother died mm -hmm. and the 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 when the mind kicked in and wanted to understand itself it was like intensely focused yeah and it's almost like seeking can channel if it's one pointed you can use it in a way to penetrate mm -hmm. maya it can be an incredibly strong uh tool yeah to penetrate maya and to get beyond itself but like you said the you know you know the whatever i said there earlier that the the mind can only bring you to a certain point Take you so to the gate, will, but not beyond. Right, so <laughs> it can't go any further than that. But um, it can result in letting go, right? Mm -hmm. Because you give up. So you know, when people who are who are who are not uh, who are proponents for for uh, letting things be as they are, it's. I think that it's really individual, and that um, everyone's going to do it in the way that life's intelligence is guiding them to do mm -hmm. so in my case it was an intensity and it was kind of like a yani path you know a mm -hmm. path of yana to inquire and to penetrate reality but in the end what is it that actually happened well it was just you know just stopping yeah everything stopped at the right time at the right time yeah. Well, you, you studied the Yoga Sutras. I mean, Patanjali talks about yogis being of mild, medium, or vehement intensity. <laughs> and he talks about the ones with the vehement intensity of, of their quest as the ones who realize most quickly. Yeah, but you've probably interviewed enough people to, to, to have 
um, probably witnessed people who haven't um, had the intensity, like Tony Parsons or somebody, right? I mean, T I don't know. Tony did a fair amount of seeking before he had his awakening. He studied with Osho, and he did a bunch of stuff. Oh, okay. He did a bunch of meditation. But his teaching yeah. is... Yeah, I mean, Sailor Bob, who, who I haven't interviewed, but you know, he meditated for years and years, and then he eventually had an awakening. So a lot of times people will do spiritual practices for 30 years, have an awakening, and then turn around and say, you don't need to do anything, you know. <laughs> exactly, and I'm yeah. not one of those. So um, right. I, I really trust in the inherent intelligence of um, each person that's coming in terms of that, you know, the internal guidance system. Yeah, one size does not fit all. No, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Ah, well, I feel very content. Um, I think partially it's the spillover from the AMA thing. I've just been kind of floating in, <laughs> in bliss for the, ever since. Oh, that's wonderful. Be, being there, but um, it's you know, it's, you know, it's talking with you enlivens that all the more. Um, Thank you. It's really, yeah. really enjoyable. Um, is there anything, uh, I know you probably need questions to really come out with more specific information, but is there anything you feel like we haven't covered that is kind of in the back of your mind or anything? Not really. I just, um, if I have any final words of, of parting that your, your audience is to um, trust, you know, where life is leading them in terms of... Um, listening more to the inner, the mm -hmm. inner guidance, and to, um, I know that we look outside of ourselves a lot at all these teachers to see which way to go, Yeah. But, and and they can be useful, but in the end, it's all going to come to um, knowing for oneself what is true, mm -hmm. and, and there is an intelligence that guides that knowing. Which wants this for you more than you want it for itself, for yourself. Because it is you. Yeah, it is you. And, uh, and you are that. So mm -hmm. there really is no separation. So the you, the small you, is contained in, that, in the vastness that you are. It's yeah. just that pinprick. So knowing yourself as the vastness really, really does alleviate so much suffering. So I understand the quest completely. Yeah. It also imbues you with, in general, great de degree of energy and intelligence because that's the kind of the nature of that vastness. It's a repository. Physicists tell us that a cubic centimeter of empty space contains more energy than the whole manifest universe. I mean, and in, in terms of our being able to live that as a human being, one thing you wrote was being inauthentic takes energy. <laughs> it, it, it's exhausting to, to merely be a pinpoint. You know, you don't you don't have the underpinnings. Uh, you don't have the, the contact with the reservoir of of infinite energy and intelligence that you actually are. And so it's like I don't know. We could use so many different metaphors, but well, as Amma put it, someone said, "How do you do this for so many hours?" And she said, "Well, you know, if uh, if you're working in somebody's factory, it's tiring." But if you own the factory, then you can just, you have plenty of energy. She so said, this is my factory. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Everything's the, our factory. Yeah. Every single thing that's happening. Yeah, including feeling lost. Mm -hmm. Then you're still working in the factory. You're not, you, you haven't owned it yet if you're feeling yeah. lost. <laughs> well, <laughs> someday. Yeah. Everything returns back. So it, there's Some, someday, no so and all this will be yours. Nothing's left behind. <laughs> right. I mean, that's really where the lack of, of um, in a sense, concern, or uh, like I don't have an intensity of wanting to share this, because I really trust that everything's returning back to itself mm -hmm. in its own time. It's it was born in time, so it's going to return in in time. Generally, people who have an intensity of wanting to share, who, you know, whom we re regard as proselytizers, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. they haven't really owned it yet. You know, there's just sort of there's an insecurity and a fear that you know, well, that needs to be a s reinf one needs to sort of reinforce one's confidence by getting other people to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're really established in that, then th that desperation, that that proselytizing tendency, drops mm -hmm. off. 
And maybe there's one more thing that I'd like to to um, share is that I see so many people not being kind to themselves mm. on the inner. Mm-hmm. Like, give me an example. Well, just self-judgment and mm. um, feelings of worthlessness and such. Mm-hmm. And that really does arise from having a sense of I. Mm-hmm. Feeling, feeling, you know, because it could never feel complete. The I will never feel whole. So it will always be in um, comparison mind when, right. when you're an I. So um, I just, um, yeah, just the just feeling when I work with people, that's one of the things that I work with. Mm. Finding more compassion and kindness for, for oneself uh-huh. here. And it translates on the outer. You mean in terms of your behavior towards others and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. It translates sure. on, in the outer how you see life. Mm-hmm. You know, so so working with that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah, there's so many more. I mean, I can always just keep going, but this this is sweet and uh, maybe a good place to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Sounds good. Thank you. Well, don't just hang up. I have to make oh. some concluding points here. Um, so I've been speaking with, let me get this right, Susanna, right? Susanna Marie. Susanna Marie, Marie yeah. Susanna Marie, the way the Germans would pronounce it. And um, you know a lot about her now if you've been listening to this interview, so I don't need to reiterate anything. But um, on batgap.com, I will have links. I've already prepared this. You sent me some stuff. There's links to her website and her Facebook page and you know how to get in touch with her how to email her and all that stuff so um, go there and um, feel free to get in touch with her um, you haven't written any books yet but I guess something's in progress or, yes okay yeah so when that's ready let me know and I'll add it to the bad Thank gap you. Yeah. Um, and this interview with Susanna is one in an ongoing series there are over 180 of them now so if you'd like to watch more um, easiest way to do it is to go to batgap.com because they're all indexed there there's an alphabetical index of all the people and then there's also a chronological index under the other stuff menu um, so you can poke around and find different ones um, there is a discussion group that springs up around each interview and uh, there's a forum now where we have those set up so you'll find a link to that on Susanna, Susanna's page and there's a place to sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted generally once a week uh, there's a donation button which I appreciate people clicking if this inter- if if my side of this interview at least looks any better than it has in the past it's because I finally got a camcorder to work which was with Skype which was purchased with that some of that donation money and we also have cam uh, we have webcams in the field that we send around from each guest sends to the next guest and it improves the general quality of the thing and uh, we're always trying to make it as good as possible there's also an audio podcast that you can subscribe to and probably as many people just listen to this in audio as watch it in video so uh, there's a link to that and it'll take you to Apple iTunes you can subscribe to the podcast get it in your iPod and I was just uh, just to elaborate a bit someone I was talking to somebody and they didn't know this they said well I have to listen to some of the interviews many times because I can't finish it all at once and then my computer doesn't remember where I was so I started from the beginning. The nice thing about iTunes, if you subscribe to the podcast, is it remembers where you are. So if you leave off and you go to play it again it'll pick up exactly where you left off. So that's an incentive for figuring that out. (laughs) So that's about it. Um, Thanks for listening or watching and we'll see you next week.